Welcome to In a Heartbeat, coming to you today from Henry Ford Hospital at the Pearson Clinic location here in Gross Point Farms. I'm Dr. David Bali, and I'm your host of In a Heartbeat. Today it's my pleasure to have as my special guest, Dr. Robert D. And today's topic will be advancements in uh, facial plastic surgery and aesthetics, and I think it's a, an area of broad, top, uh, broad interest and appeal, and so we'll get started. So Dr. D, welcome to In a Heartbeat. Thank, thank you, you for, for having me. Thank you for coming in and being our guest and taking time out of your busy schedule. Of course, it's my pleasure. <laughs> So Dr. G, we're at the uh, Pearson Clinic uh, as part of Henry Ford Hospital Medical Center here in Gross Point Farms. So for viewers who uh, may not necessarily be familiar with you or the, uh, your uh, facilities here, tell us a little bit about uh, your, your background and uh, your, your clinic here. Sure. Thanks again for having me. I'm happy to be here with you. Um, actually, the Henry Ford Medical Center here at Pearson has been here for many, many years. Um, offering a variety of different uh, specialties here in the Gross Point area. Within the last couple years, the decision was made to uh, open up a clinic that would offer basically patients uh, with uh, disorders of the ears, nose, and throat, as well as facial uh, reconstructive and facial plastic and cosmetic surgery issues. Um, I work in that capacity here with my team. I have board certification in uh, ear, nose, and throat surgery, as well as subspecialty additional training in facial plastic surgery, including cosmetic surgery of the face and neck, and reconstructive surgery of the face and neck. And we've been working in that capacity here for about two years. Great, great. Dr. Deeb, do you have any um, sub areas of interest that you think uh, are, are particular um, excitement to you that you might want to emphasize, knowing that you do all those things as well? Sure. Uh, I have an area of special interest in uh, surgery of the nose, both uh, for improving function of the nose, whether it be difficulty breathing through the nose, trauma to the nose, also people looking to improve the appearance of their nose, whether they've had a birth defect, a traumatic injury, or just looking to improve their appearance. So that is one area where I have uh, have some additional interest. And th that really is uh, a very um, highly specialized, complicated thing that it may seem simplistic, but it's very, very important to get the right person to take care of that, isn't it? I, yes, I certainly <laughs> think so. Um, it, we forget how much people look at their own faces every day. And, and the nose is the center point of the face. It's the focal point of the face. It, it is something that uh, for generations and centuries has been one of the definitions of beauty uh, is, is the nose. So people put a lot of time and effort into it. It's actually one of the more complex structures anywhere in our body because it serves both in a functional capacity to humidify air as it comes in, to allow us to breathe. It has a protective mechanism from an evolutionary standpoint. It also uh, defines who we are in terms of our ethnic background and our um, different ways that we're perceived by, by the world. So yes, it is a very specialized area. And I, I happen to love taking care of patients. And it's important that you're taking care of it. Yes. <laughs> There's a, a, a recent, I think, survey or study showed from the American Society for Plastic Surgery that about 15.6 million Americans had some type of cosmetic procedure last year. So that's a huge number. Yes. And so um, what are people having done? And is that something that uh, you think will continue to, to get larger or grow? I, I think it will. I think it will continue to grow. I think we're in an era now where there's a variety of reasons that I think is driving that number to go upward. Uh, number one, we're, we're seeing ourselves more. We're taking more photos of ourselves. We're seeing ourselves on social media. People are taking photos of us. We have instant access to cameras. Maybe these things were not happening 20, 30, 40 years ago. As a result, it's not uncommon for patients to come to me and say, uh, you know what, doc, I never really noticed it, but my eyelids are drooping a little bit more. Is there something we can do about that? Or I've noticed a few more wrinkles on my forehead. I don't like the way I look when I smile. My jowls have gotten a bit larger. And I think what has started to happen is that it, it, the, the taboo of these, some of these procedures has been, I think, released. I think uh, that's a good way to put it. It's become just more mainstream and something 
you know, like taking care of a, a cold or a, a diabetes. I, I, I agree. <laughs> I think people speak about it more openly now. It's, it's not a subject that we have to hide from. It's not uncommon for people to come in and say, you know, my mother, sister, friend had these kinds of procedures. They told me about it, and now I'd like to do it, not necessarily because they want to change who they are or how they look, but they want to feel better about themselves. And they want to look their best. And I agree with you. I think people take selfies and YouTube videos, and they're Skyping their their relatives and friends and doing all these kind of fun things. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's a reason why this has grown and, and I don't see those things going away. If they want anything, to be camera ready. <laughs> yes, everyone wants to be camera ready and those things have just continued to grow and expand and uh, as a result people are coming in requesting these things more often. What are some of the most common things uh, that uh, a patient comes in to see you for, Dr. D? I'd say there's, there's three big areas. We've already talked a bit about the nose. That's one area where people come in and they say, you know, I don't like the appearance of my nose or I don't like the way my nose, quote, works. I can't breathe through it when I'm exercising. I have these areas that bother me. So that's one of the higher, higher uh, requests that I get. Other areas is uh, the droopy eyelids I've talked about. Um, mm -hmm. That also can have a functional element as well. Sometimes the eyelids droop to a point where it can obstruct our vision. Mm -hmm. So people are talking about getting an eyelid rejuvenation surgery, both the upper eyelids and the lower eyelids. And then the third largest area is people that are interested in improving the appearance of their neck and jawline. Mm -hmm. The quote jowls or the folds in our face. Uh, with time, uh, gravity takes hold, it happens to everybody. And the skin tends to sag a bit and we get some aging processes happening kind of in, throughout our face. But uh, there tends to be an emphasis on the lower parts of the, of the face and people are coming in requesting rejuvenation procedures, both surgical things like neck and face lifting procedures, mm -hmm. as well as non-surgical techniques, mm -hmm. yeah, which are both offered. And, and kind of going back to what you were saying about the, the eyelids, not only you, you can address droopy eyelids, but a lot of times people see sort of like a, a bagginess you yes. know, under the eye, and you can help that out as well. Absolutely. It's all kind of one procedure. The eyelid's a very complex structure. This is another area where I think it's important to have some additional training and expertise in this area. Uh, you have skin, you have muscle, you have areas of fat that can be pooching out, and, and the important thing is to not treat every eyelid the same. People have unique needs, unique expectations, and uh, unique uh, problems. And, and I think it, each of those need to be addressed. And I think you've, you've hit the, the major points of what people focus on when we look at each other. We look at their eyes, their nose, and their mouth. And, uh, you know, we want to keep those at their best. Absolutely. What is a typical patient that sees you in terms of, if you could say, like a profile or a demographic or that type of thing? Sure. Uh, it depends on the issue. For, for patients with nose issues, it tends to be a younger, a little bit of a younger crowd. Um, people who have kind of already developed and they've kind of got a sense, okay, well, my nose has stopped changing. I don't like the appearance of it or I got injured in a basketball game. So that's a bit of a younger demographic. Both males and females, believe it or not, relatively equal. As we move into the uh, more facial rejuvenation uh, patients, they tend to be a bit older, though I'm sure you've realized that that age has started to shift. Um, I think 20, 30 years ago, it was uh, mostly women in their 60s and 70s looking for these rejuvenation procedures. Now, first of all, there's more men interested in this kind of thing because, again, it's become less taboo. And also, I think women are doing it at a much younger age, and they say to themselves, uh, I'm young, I'm healthy, I should be able to enjoy these procedures longer versus doing them when I'm uh, older. So that, that profile has definitely shifted. Dr. Deeb, what would you say are, um, for our viewing audience who may not necessarily know, what are some of the advancements in um, the procedures and the types of things that you do that maybe are different from five or more years ago? Sure. Um, the technology has obviously grown quite a bit in medicine in all areas, and this is one area where it has grown quite a bit. Um, number one, the downtime, meaning the time it takes to recover after these procedures has decreased dramatically. Um, for the non-surgical procedures, uh, things like Botox and different injectables, people are often back to work, obviously, same day, within 20 minutes of having the procedure. Um, put some makeup on the area or whatever the case may be and basically it's like nothing ever happened. The surgical procedures have also improved in the terms of their recovery time. Um, 
people are going home the same day in almost all cases. Uh, That's pretty amazing. Yes, you know, uh, 30, 40 years ago, it involved the two to three day hospitalization. Up to a week, people had drains and tubes coming out of their faces from all different areas. Um, all of that has, has decreased because we've learned more about the anatomy, we've learned more about these procedures, and we've realized people actually recover better at home in, in the comfort of their home with their, with their own amenities available to them. And I think that's a, one thing that's really uh, driven the resurgence of these procedures because people realize I don't have to be in hiding for a month mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be. It's a, it's a shorter downtime and that's all a result of just increasing, increasing knowledge of these areas. And Dr. Deeb, even if you take a, a look at, say, a, a facelift, the, the, the theory and the, um, uh, the techniques for that have really evolved and changed over the years. Absolutely. I think when it started out, they used to just actually pull the skin on top and then they went deeper down into the deeper tissues. Yes. And now, you know, volume is also becoming uh, an important issue. So uh, what are some of the things that you could tell somebody who may be listening that uh, you could offer them to, in terms of a, say, a facelift that may give them that natural look that people so, so much want? Sure, sure. Uh, it's, it's a good point you mentioned the natural look, because I think um, when, we, when we talk about the history of these procedures, the scared cat kind of appearance, <laughs> blown in the wind, th those days are gone. Wind tunnel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those days are gone. Um, it's much more about restoring uh, a natural look. The most common compliment that people will get after this procedure is not that you look 30 years younger, it's that you look rested. Mm -hmm. You look rejuvenated, you look like you've lost a little bit of weight. And, and often people smile to themselves and they say, if, if, if only they knew, I didn't, <laughs> uh, I had this kind of minor procedure. Um, the downtime is shorter, often in a facelift patient, we are able to do it sometimes in a in a uh, office setting, depending on how how much we're trying to achieve. Um, patients, believe it or not, sometimes are even awake for the procedure. I know that sounds kind of kind of wild, but uh, there's very little pain associated with the procedures. That's just great. Um, and if people, uh, it's I, I'd hate to I don't want I me mean, to minimize it, but it's kind of like going to the dentist. You kind of you, you hear him working, you feel him working, but you're comfortable with the fact that he's right there, and you guys are able to have a conversation about it. So I would say not uncommonly, patients are able to have it in, in comfort. Uh, in comfort. Dr. D, what would you say, are there any sort of, uh, sort of uh, niche or nuanced procedures that you might want to uh, tell our audience that they may not necessarily be aware of? One that comes to mind is there, there's a lip shortening procedure. Uh, there is a lip shortening, yeah. And, and yeah. You, may, you may think of other things that, that you might want to comment on. Yeah, so the lips are interesting. They've also gone through an evolution. Uh, you can imagine probably at some time in history we've injected anything you can think of into the lips. <laughs> <laughs> uh, women have always desired a fuller look um, to the lip. Again, we've gone into a more minimally evasive approach to that. Um, often filler is being injected into the lips at this point. Um, to give that powdier appearance to the lip. Again, that's a procedure that takes about 20 minutes. It's done right in the office. Uh, the lip shortening procedure is interesting. It does involve some very tiny incisions right below the nose where the lip meets the nose. And uh, it can involve shortening the amount of what we call the, uh, the white lip or the non-wet lip mm -hmm. um, in, in hopes of kind of bringing up that red part of the lip and, and making it look a little bit fuller. Again, something that takes probably 20 to 30 minutes done in the office setting, and it's becoming more popular. In our natural aging process, the, that upper portion of the lip tends to be lengthened somewhat. Yes. And uh, the normal one-third to two-thirds ratio becomes more 50-50. Yes. So something like that, which is, not, uh, which is a, a pretty simple procedure, can really give more of a youthful appearance to, per, to a person, kind of reestablishing that more youthful proportion. I agree completely because, as you said, really everything sags as we old. As we age. <laughs> <laughs> let's just let's just we let's just say, need those marionette <laughs> strings to keep yes, us pulled up. Yeah, out. let's just say how it is. And uh, <laughs> you know, the lip is another one of those focal points of the face. It's right in the middle of the face. It's something our eye is immediately drawn to when we look at someone's face. So maybe going upward a little bit. What about a patient's brow? Uh, yeah, that's another discussion we often have. The brow position is very important in women. Women uh, uh, and men, frankly, look at their brow position quite a bit. 
um, the first thing people notice is that their forehead is getting a lot of wrinkles. And that's something that is a relatively easy fix these days. We have something called Botox. It's an injection. It's become very common. Um, and it works as a paralyzing agent. It's actually used throughout the body with a lot of medical purposes. We use it in the throat for people that have voice issues. I know it's used in the bladder on some occasions. It's used all throughout the body, but we found a unique I'd way I'd hopefully to use not it. want to get that injection. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have found a good uh, use for it in the, in the upper third of the face is, mm -hmm. is, is the areas that I usually use it the most. And that's for people that have developed wrinkles in the forehead, between the eyes, around the eyes, and it works to basically paralyze those muscles from, uh, from contracting and, you, and creating the wrinkle. Now people say, oh well, I don't want to, again, we get back to this natural versus unnatural kind of look. And I think that it's striking that balance. You don't want to make someone expressionless. Uh, mm -hmm. People always say to themselves, will I still be able to smile? Yes, you'll still be able to smile. Your mouth is going to work just fine. <laughs> um, but some people feel like when they smile, they get all of these wrinkles everywhere, and it becomes a little bit unsightly. Um, changing the brow position is also possible. It, it's, it involves a brow lift, uh, which is, again, there's and been an evolution. That can be important because despite the, uh, the simplicity of something like Botox, uh, sometimes people need something in addition to that to address that brow. Sometimes people need a little more. And mm -hmm. again, that's something where... 40, 50 years ago, it involved a huge incision over the top of the head, lifting up the entire brow. Now we have something that we do endoscopically, which is a... a do a little tiny incision tiny inc tucked in the hair. Precisely. Tiny incisions, kind of like how we've developed laparoscopic surgery for the belly without making huge incisions. It's a similar idea. We use cameras. We're able to make smaller incisions, go down into the brow area without making this huge incision, and make some slight repositioning. And I think that's one area, uh, when we talk about technological advances in the, in the field, that's one area that I think has uh, improved things. Uh, that, yeah, I think people like those more minimally invasive uh, types of procedures that you know, uh, have a lot of impact and smaller incisions and so on. Um, maybe getting back to Botox a little bit, um, one statistic I saw so that said that probably about a third of Botox current users are under the age of 30. Yes. And so um, I think many people don't necessarily realize that. Is there uh, an age where people should start considering uh, Botox use or is there a, a benchmark or what, what would your guideline be? Say, so, say for example a woman who's 22, 23, 24 said you know, I'm starting to notice these lines when I do this or that, you know, is she a candidate for Botox? Well, first of all, I think it's important to make sure what the person's goals are. Okay, why do they want this procedure done? If someone comes to me and says, I want this procedure done because I want to look for my, I want to look like my favorite celebrity. That's a bit of a red flag. That's not the reason to do these procedures. Or uh, my significant other, or whoever the case is, doesn't like me anymore and I want to look better for them. Those are not the reasons to do these procedures. These procedures should be done to make people feel better about themselves, to make people look a little more rested, a little more rejuvenated. And yeah, the pendulum has swung to a younger age group. And I, it's not uncommon at all for me to get both men and women um, in their 20s saying, you know, I kind of want to start this. Let me try it, so to speak. It's very safe. As long as they don't have any medical condition that would prevent me from wanting to um, perform it I, is something I would be comfortable with. And it's something that I think has been shown that can be preventative in yes. terms of an anti-aging type of procedure. Maybe starting out at a younger age and just kind of a, a addressing that and kind of nipping in the butt. I agree. There has been some good you know, scientific research to show when you get regular injections versus going once every couple years or ever, whenever you have a big event, there has been some research to show that you actually get more benefit out of each injection. It starts to last a little bit longer. The muscles start to relax a little bit more with time. Um, and that's something I've seen in my patients that come back regularly. They're, they're telling me that, you know what, that last injection lasted a lot longer than it has in the past. There is a thought that if we start earlier, we can prevent some of these things. And touching ab upon what you were discussing earlier, uh, men uh, are more interested in these procedures as well. And I, I think an example of that is, you know, sometimes we see on television lots of ads for skincare products for men. Um, and I think 
that men is, although it's a smaller group, it's the fastest growing demographic in terms of wanting uh, cosmetic procedures and, and offerings. And what would you say to that? I agree. Uh, I'm definitely seeing men coming in. It's, it's, it's basically, I think there was this idea, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, that men weren't supposed to have this done. Uh, we weren't supposed to care about our looks or care about our appearance. Mm -hmm. And that has really shifted a lot, you know. It, it's become okay to want these procedures. I do get men come in and qu quite frequently, hey, well, when I frown, I look like I'm angry, I, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, whatever the case may be. Is there anything I can do about that? And I do have uh, younger patients coming in and getting both. I think women still, uh, from a pure numbers standpoint, I'm sure you would agree there are more, but the shift is definitely going towards, towards men. Men probably, I would say, have a little bit, or maybe a little bit more apprehensive of kind of bringing this discussion forward, but they, the interest is there. And to a guy who may be listening who say, yeah, I, I, I would like to explore that, but I feel sheepish about doing that, what would you say to them? I would say you shouldn't. You should not feel that way. Number one, you're not the only person. I think men are afraid that they're trying something radical, something that hasn't been tried before. I, you know, I get a lot of men ask me, are, you know, do guys do this kind of thing? And when yeah. I tell them yes, they, it's almost like they feel a sense of relief. Sure. Right? I mean, there's this bond between men that we don't, we want to feel like we're not doing anything that's not, quote, unmanly or whatever yeah, the case may sure. be. And once I'm able to put them at ease, you'd be surprised. And when, when um, men are coming in for your recommendations, what are the most common things that you see that uh, men are having uh, with your uh, uh, services that you have to sure. offer? Whether they're um, non-surgical or surgical. So going back to the nose, it's very common for young males to be uh, interested in changing the shape of their nose. Um, men tend to be a little rougher in sports, so they certainly break their nose more often. So it's not uncommon for uh, a man in his 20s or 30s coming to me and say, hey, when I was a teenager, I broke my nose. I didn't really care about it then, but now I look at my nose and it's really crooked. Or mm -hmm. I don't like the tip, or I don't like the profile. Or when I smile, it does something kind of funny. So it's not uncommon at all for men to come in. Um, I've, I've been, I don't want to say surprised, but it, it's, it's just as common for men to come in with questions about their nose as it is with women. So maybe kind of following up on that, um, what would a typical consultation with you be? Say somebody says, well, I, I want to look my best, but sure. I just don't know what, where to start or where to go and they make an appointment for you uh, for a consultation. Sure. What, maybe take us through that. Yeah. Uh, and number one, we do a full uh, medical history. We're, we're doctors first. We take vital signs. We make sure they're in uh, good health. Or if there are medical conditions, we address those. We see what medications patients are taking, what procedures they may have already had done, um, if they have any allergies, things like that. Uh, something that we do for all of our patients. Then I think it's important to tease out of them a little bit what their primary complaint is. Some people just come in and say, well, I don't know, what do you think? And then I'll go through uh, what I would consider to be a facial analysis, dividing the face up into the upper third, the middle third, and the lower third, talking about each of those areas. And I think that's an important thing because you're really an expert and to, to be, for you to give them your advice, I think, is important in, to, in addition to hearing what they have to say. Yeah, and I think it's striking that balance. Yeah. Often patients will tell me, uh, you know what, Doc, I don't, I don't care about my eyelids. They're fine. They're like my mom's. Don't worry about those. So I obviously won't spend as much time on the eyelids uh, v versus someone who says I'd really like to focus on my neckline, my nose, or my forehead. But there are patients who come in and they just say, well, what do you think? I want to treat myself to something. I want to look my best. And then I'll go through these different areas that are, you know, quote, problem areas for almost everybody. The neckline always, almost always sags at some point. Mm -hmm. We get deepening of some of the grooves in our face. We develop wrinkles around our eyes. We develop uh, sagginess of the eyelids. Those are the areas that I know um, can be improved relatively easily, and patients have very high success rates. And I, I think when people undergo these types of uh, procedures appropriately, um, they really do feel better, don't yes. they? Aren't they happier, feel a little bit more, have more self-confidence? It's a, it's a shocking change. Yeah. I mean, I've seen, uh, you know, from the young female 
who who has no confidence because she just cannot stand the way her nose looks in photos. And I've seen women come in and it's like they're whole different, completely different people. It makes me feel good that I'm that I'm able to help people in that sure. way. And and the patients are just so appreciative. They're so happy. It's really can be a life changing experience for people. So, Dr. Deeb, if somebody wanted to, to see you, um, uh, are you mainly here at the peace person clinic? Or are yeah. you elsewhere? My and primary how, would, how would a person see you and what hours do you see patients? Uh, my primary location is here at the uh, Pearson Clinic, Tuesday through Thursday. I also have uh, some time where I see patients at the main Henry Ford Hospital downtown. Um, basically, patients can call. Uh, 1-800-HENRY-4 or, or whatever number may be available. I also have a website pre website presence through Henry Ford as well where people can write me questions, uh, uh, ask the doctor kind of thing, uh, and we can get back to you on those subjects as well. And as we close, Dr. D, in maybe about a minute or so, is there anything else you'd like to say to our viewing audience that you haven't already touched upon? Well, I think this has been a great opportunity. Um, like I said, a lot of these procedures were previously taboo. They weren't necessarily being discussed openly, and that is changing. Social media is changing that. Uh, open and honest discussions with, pa with patients and doctors is changing that. Forums like this, frankly, is, is, is changing that. Um, I certainly want to thank you for this opportunity. I've, I've really enjoyed it. And I want to thank you. I know you're a busy uh, physician, and I thank you for your time. It's not easy to take time out of the middle of your day. I, I know you're just finishing up with a patient before you start, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to our viewers as well. As always, we, we appreciate the time that you spend with us. Uh, take good care of yourself and those around you, and have a great day.